Greetings, my fellow Americans, and welcome to another episode of the Great Montana Conspiracy Podcast. Now, I'm going to start saying this up front just because waiting until the end of the video is kind of pointless, but if you like what you hear, you like what I'm saying, you like my message, please like and subscribe, share the information. By all means, this needs to get out there. Let me start by pointing out that tonight's episode is part two, and I, I plan on a three-part series on the subject of justice. Now, as a reminder to anybody who didn't see my last episode, I was actually sitting outside the Flathead County Justice Center for a while uh, on uh, Monday night. And it just, as I'm sitting here staring at this sign, I'm just thinking to myself, <laughs> it is such a joke. I mean, the concept of justice in Flathead County at all, much as having a center of justice, is it, just absurd. And it prompted me to get the idea of discussing and talking about what the word justice is supposed to mean. Now, having said this, um, obviously anybody who's listened to my podcast for any length of time knows there is no justice. Not there, There's very little justice. There are some people who actually commit crimes, who are actually prosecuted, who are actually held account for their crimes. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that all justice is a facade. But a large percentage of it in Flathead County most certainly is. And the problem comes from the concept of what we perceive to be justice. In the last episode, I talked quite a bit about, about the overcriminalization of crimes and everything else and the, the standards of justice are supposed to be in a liberal democracy. And I, and I won't belabor those issues again, but it's important to understand where the starting point is. Once again, a lot of the framework and the inspiration for this particular series comes from an article by Clark Niley, who's the Senior Vice President for Legal Studies at the Cato Institute, which is a libertarian organization. They focus on public advocacy, media exposure, and societal influence. And quite frankly, I'm finding a lot of their articles are very much in line with, with the information I'm trying to get out there. So when I, came, when I came, went to research the concept of justice, this article just really spoke to me. And therefore, it's really structured my idea of how I'm going to present the argument, if not in full, and I certainly do draw some information from, the, from that article. And again, I will provide the link in the description to this video. But it's not entirely drawn from there, but it is the, the, the framework and the format is structured by it because I think that Clark did a wonderful job. He did a wonderful job presenting this argument. And, and honestly, go read that article because that article just, it's just it's so poignant, just to the point, and he really does a much better job than what I'm doing, but I hope that my expounding upon the topic will, in some ways, clarify or help give better background on how these issues apply to Montana and the Great Montana Conspiracy. Now, before I go on, I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago. I got asked <laughs> in, a, uh, in an email, I got asked, what's the deal with my shirts? Okay, I'm just going to make a very quick aside here. Just hopefully this is the only time I have to address this. I'm a geek. Flag flying. Very, very happy to be a geek. 99% of my wardrobe is geek related. Whether it be video games, fantasy, comic books. This particular do this particular t-shirt is uh, the 10th Doctor. Um, uh, David Tennant. He had a very common, a couple of very common sayings. Keep calm and I own Z. And it's just what the t-shirt means. It means keep calm and out on Z. It's a Doctor Who reference. But that being said, um, the, the person who asked me what to do with my shirts, um, I think he was thinking of you know, trying to promote a comic book store or some business. I'm not. This is just me. This is just my style, what I like. And hey, if you want to contribute to my style, go ahead. Send me t-shirts. I will wear them and I will give you credit for sending them to me. I mean, hey, it'd be fun. It'd be kind of a, a participation, an audience participation thing. Know that I'm really posting these videos. Um, if you do decide to send me t-shirts, and I'm, I'm not saying you have to, it's a joke. Um, but if you do, I wear a large, just point of reference. Anybody who wants to support the, the cause, it'd be fantastic to get new, sh new shirts. <laughs> but it's just a joke. Um, it's not a serious request. But, of course, you can support the program and you can support my efforts to try to get the information out there. And in whatever way you feel that's necessary, please look at the information in the content attached to this video for more ideas on how to do that. But, anyway, back to the subject of the podcast. As I said, I previously discussed the unconstitutional overcriminalization of law 
in the United States. Um, and it, this is also leads to what um, Clark calls, and I, I love this term, point and convict adjudication. Point and convict, not point and click, point and convict. Basically, it's, okay, that person looks like a, looks easy, just point, convict him, throw him in the, in the rubble. Point, convict him, throw him in the rubble. It literally is that, it really is that simple. It's drawn out a little, it's a little faster than that, or not as fast as that perhaps in the real world, but it nevertheless is really that simple. And the reason why, and I've discussed a lot of these elements in my previous videos, and it has nothing to do with Clark's articles. I've actually discussed this and I have expressed interest in pursuing other topics of this nature, dealing with pre-child detention, plea bargaining, presumed guilt, fear and retaliation, um, defective information system used to bypass the grand jury, all these methods that are used to instill a, a, a streamlined prosecutorial system that convicts 95% of people without a jury trial. And, 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 I, and I cannot emphasize this point strongly enough. A jury trial is a constitutionally mandated mechanism. Let me say that again. It is a constitutionally mandated mechanism. Nowhere in the Constitution does it suggest plea bargains. Nowhere does it say that someone can bypass a jury trial by making a plea bargain with the state. Nothing like that exists in the Constitution. It was never the founders' intent. The founders' intent was that individuals had a right to stand up and defend themselves against accusations. That the state bore a burden to prove. Emphasis on burden. They're the ones who are supposed to suffer any backlash or consequence, they're the ones who have to work at it. They should not be able to coerce people into confessions. And that's precisely what the system sets up to do. Every American is entitled to a jury trial. Every citizen, every United States citizen is entitled to it. But as I said, 95% of the people who get charged don't take it up on it. Believe me, if you would actually, if you're out there and you're convicted of a crime, guilty or innocent, stand trial, folks. You're going to break the system. You're going to break the back of this corrupt system because they can't afford to do it. They cannot afford to take every case to trial. They simply cannot afford to do it. This is why plea bargains were created, was to streamline and to make it far more expeditious and less costly to prosecute and to throw people in prison. And then that starts the whole prison for profit system, which yet again is another system I really need to talk about, but I won't belabor this particular video on that. But look it up. Prison for profit. It's a huge issue, but I'll, I will come back to it and talk about it, I promise. Um, okay, so if the, the jury trial is the constitutionally mandated program and 95% of people prosecuted don't exercise that mandate, what does that say for our judicial system? How does it say for our judiciary, for our criminal justice system? How can there be justice if 95% of the people don't employ the, the constitutionally mandated protection against self-incrimination, and the right to challenge accusations brought against them. And this is why. What? Why would people do this? Why would 95% of America say, okay, you know what, I, I will plead guilty to a crime. I'll just take consequences. Why would 95% of the people do this? And this is really important to distinguish. This isn't just criminals being compelled to speak to their crimes. This is just as many innocent people being coerced to say things. There's a reason why torture is not an effective method of, of information gathering, because people who are under torture, who are under coercion, who are under intimidation and threat, make stuff up to get out from under the threat and harm. If you've got bamboo being shoved under your nail, if you're being waterboarded, you're going to say whatever it takes to stop that torture. You're going to say whatever it takes to stop that threat. What do I have to do to be free of harm? If I can't run away... I need to do whatever this person is asking me to do just to save myself from further harm. Innocent or guilty alike, it works on both. It works on both. If you are perfectly innocent, if, if someone says, hey, I saw you rob that convenience store, and you are in a different state entirely, but they've got you in jail, they've got you under a bail you can't get out of, you're going to lose your job, your home, you're, not, you're going to lose your visitation to your kids, your wife is going to divorce you, they're threatening to to charge your wife as a, as a co-conspirator, throw her in jail, the kids are going to end up in foster care. What do you do? 
yeah, I did it. Let me out. Let me take care of my family. Because my family is far more important than, than whether or not I, I, I pay a fine or I go to jail. But let me protect my family. Let me protect myself. Let me protect somebody besides you. When you sit here and you coercively compel people to make statements that you want to hear, you're no longer concerned about the truth. You're only concerned about what you get out of it. And so long as the justice system isn't interested in justice, it is a joke to call it that. There is no justice in convicting innocent people. There, there is no justice in it. But this coercive plea bargain that goes on, which is the, the primary focus I'm going to work on tonight, it, it's, it's an insane aspect. They, they will put you in jail. They will threaten you with consequences. They will access you with, I've already talked about excessive pretrial detention, excessive bails. This, the cost of defense, bringing up this costly defense to try to defend yourself against these accusations. Threats and intimidations against witnesses, family. If you're locked up, you can't gather witness, you can't gather information for yourself, you can't gather witnesses for yourself. They, they oftentimes will threaten you with multiple charges. They'll stack multiple charges to get you to agree to one. If you if, let's use the, the robbery one. Okay, I'm going to not only charge you with robbery, I'm going to charge you with assault with a deadly weapon, I'm going to charge you with um you know, with a string of a string of robberies, or maybe uh, maybe a you know a grand theft auto. We're going to throw some other charges on there, and we're going to we'll agree to drop these other charges if you agree to plead guilty to the to the theft, to the burglary. It's called stacking charges. When you stack these multiple charges on in order to coerce and compel, it's a very effective system. You you start to lose hope. You start to you're going down this rabbit hole. And you have no way out except to cooperate with the people who are holding you down. These excessive penalties also are applied when it comes to, to jury trials. I mean, you're saying, okay, if you go if you go to a jury trial, you're going to if you agree to co to cooperate with us and plead to this, we'll give you five years. But if you go to trial, I'll give you life. If you go to trial and you lose, you face life imprisonment or some excessively harsher penalty than if you take this plea bargain. I'm innocent. But can I afford to loot, to have my entire life thrown away? Can I afford to lose 20 years of my life? Can I afford to lose 10 years of my life? Can I afford to lose any more time than what they're throwing at me just to get out of here and try to get my life back? Honestly, I was, anybody who knows my story knows that I spent five years and inside the incarcerated system refusing to confess to a crime I didn't commit. I wouldn't break. But I was surrounded by people who broke every day. And maybe not every, literally every day, but, but you know what I'm talking about. People who I honestly and sincerely, having heard their sides of events, believe are innocent, would confess to crimes just to get out. Just to try to get on with their lives, to get past this point because they break. For myself, I looked at myself and said, I can't look in the mirror every day and know I'm, my freedom is gained by a lie. I can't live a lie. That was my sobering mantra, if you will. I can't live a lie. Other people don't have that ability. They don't, they don't have the ability to stand. I'm, I was convicted in 2004. The accusation first came up in 2003. It is now 2021, and I'm still maintaining my innocence in spite of fear, in spite of threats, in spite of intimidation, in spite of consequences that have been thrown at me left, right, and center. I'm still standing my ground. Not everybody has been able to do that. Not, not everybody has been willing to take that stance and say, I refuse to yield. It's not as common a, a principle as one might think. Anyone thinks when they're faced with a mortal threat, they're going to stand up and be, I'm going to be the hero. I, you don't know until you actually suffer it. I, I would not, I mean, surely, I, mean, I would have said, I'll never admit to this long before I ever went down and went to jail, went to prison, have been under threat and intimidation by the state authorities ever since. I could not have said, honestly, in the beginning, if I could have buckled. And, and I'll be honest with you, there was a time, there was a, more than a couple of times, I was ready to give up. 
there was more. There was three di different instances inside the prison system where I was ready to com commit suicide because I was ready to give up. There was a couple of times I was willing to say, you know, just tell me whatever you want me to say and I will say it. Just let me out. But I recovered my, my footing. I got my traction back under me and I kept moving forward. If I had simply not gotten back up, I could be another statistic. I could be another innocent person convicted, forced and, and, and coerced into making a, a confession I didn't com of a crime I didn't commit. But here I am all these years later, and I'm still maintaining my innocence, despite the fact that there's an overwhelming number of people out there who will tell you I am lying, I am manipulative, I am this, I am that. I can only live with myself. I know I'm telling the truth. I know, and I'm telling you with absolute sincerity, I'm the one who has to live with myself. I could not live telling a lie. Do you honestly think that I could live... 18 years with a lie about how I didn't do it? Honestly? It'd be a far easier road for me if I simply admitted to what they wanted me to admit to. But here I am. I have endured this coercive efforts to plea bargain. I have endured the coercive threats about going to trial. I have endured all these pre-trial threats. And one would think that this is something that the government would not allow. I mean, this is, why would they allow this? And that's the problem. The judiciary who has the responsibility to oversee this, to declare this practice unconstitutional, to declare this practice improper and unethical, are supporting it because it streamlines the system. Remember, and I've said this in so many of my other videos, judges are lawyers, they are part of the legal system. They are not above and beyond. They are not separate. They do not come from a different field. They are. They come from the very ground of which the people they are being asked to oversee. You're asking the foxes to oversee the foxes and how they treat the chickens. You're not going to have an ally out of a judge nine times out of ten. You're going to, they're going to be allied with that attorney or they're going to be allied with the state because that's who they are are. They're not independent. They're not standalone. They are not they are not an impartial judiciary. They're just not. And for time and time again the judiciary that has a constitutional obligation to protect the civil liberties of the citizens of the United States stand in favor of the state, their fellow attorneys, and the lawmakers because that's who they are. I mean, just as an example, and I'm going to throw some examples at you, just to give you, the U.S. Supreme Court has come back time and time again and said that this is acceptable practice. There's a case, and this is actually a case that, that uh, Clark brought up. So credit to Clark where Clark is due. Um, it's called Borden-Kircher v. Hayes, and notation, volume 434 of the U.S. Supreme Court's um, Reporter, page 357, it's a 1978 case. So the actual notation is 434 U.S. 357. Their decision basically said that coercive threats of harsher sentence are permissible when it comes to pre-trial uh, plea bargaining. They first started out, and, and when they started talking about, about issues of retrial, they, they, they outlawed it. They said... To punish a person because he has done what the law plainly allows him to do is due process violation of the most basic sort. Except they're talking about somebody, if they're retried, the prosecution can't come back with a harsher penalty for them coming back and retrying their case. However, they went on to say about the pre-trial process. In the give and take of plea bargaining, there is no such element of punishment, retaliation, so long as the accused is free to accept or reject the prosecution's offer. Excuse me? They're free to accept or reject? Right. Uh-huh. If you go to trial and you lose, you're going to face 50 years. Or you can take a plea deal right now for five. You're free to accept or reject that. That's intimidation of the highest order. 
I am threatening you with a consequence if you do not do this. You are not free to, sure, you can accept or reject it. If somebody comes up to you and threatens to stab you with a knife, if you don't jump off a cliff, you can still accept or reject it. If someone says, hey, you punch that girl or I'm going to, I'm going to slash your, your, I'm going to blow up your car. And you don't punch the girl. Sure, you have a choice not to do it, but you could lose your car. I mean, come on. It, it comes down to the point of, at what point is, I mean, intimidation, of course, you're free to, to decline an intimidation issue anytime. It's still a crime. Intimidation and coercion are crimes, ladies and gentlemen. They are felonies. Felonies that the prosecutors are legally allowed to do and the U.S. Supreme Court has upheld them. There's another case called United States v. Goodwin. 457 U.S. 368. It's a 1982 case. If a prosecutor brings additional charges after a defendant refuses to accept a plea bargain, a court cannot presume that the additional charges are an impermissible penalty for the defendant's refusal. Excuse me? If you say, I'm going to offer you this plea deal for the burglary, and you don't accept it, so I throw, I stack some more charges on top of that, really, you can't see that as a connection? You can't, you're at, and, and, the, and it's not that they don't, the, for, the United States Supreme Court forbid it. You can, they said you cannot consider this to be a, a, a consequence of the accused being punished. They said a court cannot, not may not or should not, cannot presume that the additional charges of an impermissible penalty for the defendant's refusal. That is a bar from the United States Supreme Court saying you cannot do this. You cannot consider the possibility of prosecutorial vindictiveness just because they refused. Excuse me, that's called cause and effect, ladies and gentlemen. That's like saying, if I have a switch to a floodgate, and I push that button, and that floodgate opens, I cannot presume that pushing that button caused that floodgate to open, even if the sign and the mechanism, you understood the mechanism was going to, con the consequence was going to happen, the consequence happened as you expected, in direct, re in direct response to you pushing that button, you cannot be held accountable that that floodgate went up. That makes sense. It doesn't to me. The United States Supreme Court has upheld it. And they said it's okay. They said it's permissible. They say it's allowable. Something that is not allowed by the Constitution of the United States of America, the U.S. Supreme Court has said is acceptable. I see a huge problem with that. I see a significant problem with that. And I hope you see a problem with that because what are, we, what are you listening to this for if you're not, if you don't? One more case. And this is a really important one because it deals with an idea that it's actually a contrary point the United States Supreme Court has said. And they just disregard it. In Blackledge v. Perry, 417 U.S. 21, is a 1974 case. The United States Supreme Court said due process requires that no apprehension of prosecutorial vindictiveness can exist. There can be no, even the slightest apprehension. There cannot be any measure, any slight consideration that prosecutorial vindictiveness could exist. It says due process forbids this. What do you call these threatening and intimidating circumstances where somebody puts a plea bargain and threatens you consequences if you don't cooperate? What do you call being put in jail indefinitely under a bail you cannot afford? Denied all aspects of, of due process. You don't get a you don't get a due process a, a, a probable cause challenge. You don't get a grand jury. When you do go before a jury, it's it's completely controlled by the by the state. You're given an attorney that will get paid regardless of whether he wins or loses. He has absolutely no investment in in the case. It's it's an insane prospect. The United States Supreme Court has said that literally, you can't do this. And yet, the burden to prove this impossible standard has been made. 
when a court can't even consider whether prosecutorial vindictiveness exists, how can you even consider whether the spectrum can, can come, come about? If the court, if the high, highest court of the land forbids you to even consider that prosecutorial vindictiveness could be in play, how can you even possibly qualify for prosecutorial vindictiveness to happen? How can the due process measure even be gauged if you're not even allowed to raise it? If you are forbidden by the United States Supreme Court to even raise it? It's a trap, ladies and gentlemen. It's a trap. It's like saying, okay, Mr. Glick, you're responsible for the brain surgery tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. I have no clue how to do brain surgery. Well, it doesn't matter. The bar is there. It's your responsibility. How am I supposed to prove I can't do this if it's automatic? If it's an automatic, I have to do it. In this case, the court's told they can't do something. They can't even consider it. They're forbidden to consider it. And yet, they're also told the due process says that you can't even have a, a whimsical chance, possibility of prosecutorial vindictiveness, but you can't consider it. It's, it's this end runaround that just makes it impossible to even consider it. The bar is so high that it's impossible to even bring in prosecutorial vindictiveness because it's forbidden by the very court's own decisions. So how do you determine whether it exists if you're not even allowed to consider it? I'm just, I, I know I'm running around, around our circles on this issue, but it's just... It's so mind-boggling to me that nobody sees this. Nobody cares about this. Nobody wants to point out the issues that, look, this is a serious problem. Oh, our, our system is fair and just. It's not. Once again, and I, wanna, I cannot reiterate this strongly enough, coercion and intimidation are crimes. They are felonies. If anybody else, if I were to go to somebody accused of a crime and threaten their family if they take a plea deal, if you take that plea deal, I'm going to shoot your wife. I'm going to jail. I'll throw your wife in a hole so deep she can't, she's not going to be able to see out of it if you take that plea deal. But a prosecutor can do exactly the same thing. I'm going to throw your wife in prison, the deepest, darkest cell I can possibly find, if you don't take that plea deal. What's the difference? One's a crime, one's not? No. Where, where's the justice there? Where's the equality there if the prosecutors can commit crimes in order to affect justice? And I just want to be clear. I'm not making this up. Montana Code Annotated. Section 45.5203. This is Montana's law. Intimidation. A person commits the offense of intimidation when, with the purpose to cause another to perform or omit the performance of any act, the person communicates to another under circumstances that reasonably tend to produce a fear that it will be carried out, a threat to perform without lawful authority any of the following acts, inflict physical harm on the person threatened or any other person, Subject any person to physical confinement or restraint or commit any felony. That's a crime, ladies and gentlemen. That describes those first two aspects right there, A and B, and technically C because they're committing the felony, are the literal and direct acts of the state in these coercive plea bargain issues. They are crimes. It's criminal misconduct. It's official misconduct, which is in itself another felony in the state of Montana. They're allowed to commit crimes in the pursuit of justice. How is that even conceivable that we can still use the word justice? In, in a constitutional mandated issue where a jury is a required element... The idea, and as I said for the very beginning of this podcast, it is supposed to be the burden of the state to prove, not the burden of the defendant to prove. Innocent until proven guilty only means that if the, if the accused is presumed innocent, faces no consequences, faces no burden, the state bears the burden to prove the crime. Except in our system, it's so warped that anyone accused automatically goes to jail, is held in pretrial detention, is is subjected to these horrific threats and intimidations. Criminal, act, criminal aspects conducted against them, they are imprisoned, which 
Constitution technically is kidnapping because they have not been convicted of a crime. Held under a bail they count for, which is forbidden, is forbidden by the Constitution. No excessive bails. Yet there we are. <sighs> Plea bargains bypass this constitutional mandate. It permits a streamlined, factory-like process to allow people to be prosecuted, thrown in prison, and, and all defines of any concept of justice. doesn't matter if you're innocent, guilty. It's like, it's like Clark said, it's point and convict. These massive threats of harm, the worst punishments, the literal devastation of one's life. Innocent and guilty alike plead guilty when threatened with these kinds of consequences. It's just human nature. We want to protect ourselves and we will do whatever is necessary to protect ourselves even if we have to be dishonest to do it. The entire process is unconstitutional. Not, not just the threats and coercion. The entire process. Held in pretrial detention. Excessive bails. No constitutional pretrial protection. No post-conviction protection. Massive influx from for the prison for profit system. The incentives being provided to the states and the counties and everybody else to profit off of the prosecutions of individuals in mass prosecutions. All this is unconstitutional. The United States already has the highest per capita incarceration in the world. We're supposed to be the land of the free and home of the brave. We are the land of the incarcerated, ladies and gentlemen. We hold more people per capita in prison than any other country in the world. And I'm talking about North Korea and China to boot. We have more people incarcerated, and not just by a little bit. We're talking massively, massively outnumbered. We're like five times more incarcerated than the highest, the closest competitor when it comes to countries. And what's worse, this is going to sound insane, but Montana has an even higher per capita than any other country in the world, including the United States. Montana alone has 789 to every 100,000 people in jails and prisons. And that's not counting the people who are on probation, who are in some kind of deferred sentence, who are under home arrest. We're talking just the people in jails and prisons. Just the people in jails and prisons. 789 per 100,000. The U.S. national numbers are 664 to 100,000. There's over a hundred per capita difference. Montana it grossly exceeds not only the world, but, the, but its own country as a whole. Because massive pretrial detention, massive post-trial detention, massive incarceration across the board, deprivation of civil liberties left, right, and, and forward, and it's the great Montana conspiracy at its core is powered by the eradication of any concept of civil liberty. It's all doctrine. We have civil rights. No, we don't. Not in Montana, we don't. We only have civil rights if the government wants us to have civil rights. We only have liberty if they choose to give it to us. There's a site, and I'm going to provide a link, by the way, um, in a, a second link inside my description. There's a site, and I really want you to go to this site. But this site is, is just... It, it's just the whole page has got Montana statistics. It's right there in charts and graphs and everything else, and it'll blow your mind. It's called prisonpolicy.org slash profiles slash mt dot html. I'll repeat that. Prisonpolicy.org forward slash profiles forward slash mt dot html. Go there. Look at the graphs. Look at the statistics. These are scary, ladies and gentlemen. I said it before. The government officials face zero consequences for their actions. They face an apps. And, and the next video, by the way, we'll be talking more in depth about that. But I've already said it in my other videos. Zero consequences. They can heap all this cost and, and consequence onto the people who are being accused. The prosecutors themselves go home without any penalty or loss. They don't lose their jobs if they lose the case. They don't, they don't face any consequence whatsoever for their misconduct, for mishandling, for their threats, their intimidation, their own crimes. No consequences. 
they're above the law. Justice is the means by which established injustices are sanctioned. That is a quote. It's from a poet, turn of the century poet, um, Antoine France. It's from a, a, one of his works called Ronquibie. And trust me, I had to look up the pronunciation on that because it is a really long, weird French word. C-R-A-I-N-G-Q-U-E-B-I-L-L-E. One word, 1903. It's a play in, that the, the, the poet wrote up. It's a scary story in three acts. If you want to read it, read it. But the quote is just perfect for tonight's theme. Justice is the means by which established injustices are sanctioned. But how can injustice be sanctioned if only one side is accountable? If the government can use injustice in the pursuit of justice, where is justice? What, where's the line? Especially when that same injustice is being used to frame innocent people and they don't care what harm they cause and the consequence and the pursuit of this zealous need to put people in prison. Not because they're criminals, not because they're because they need the bottom dollar. They need they need those numbers. It comes down to the prison for profit system. It comes down to building their, their jackets for elections. It comes down to convincing the people that they're doing a job that they don't need to be doing. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, seven hundred and eighty nine per one hundred thousand in jail, in prisons, in some kind of detention facility, and that is not counting the people who are out on probation, parole, which are still a form of supervision, still a form of custody, people in home, home arrests, people who suffer some kind of limitation or restriction as a consequence of a conviction. Montana dwarfs everyone, including the country's national numbers as a whole. And the United States dwarfs everybody else in the world. There's a problem here, ladies and gentlemen, a significant problem, and it's one that comes down to the question, how can you have justice when crimes are committed to enforce it? You can't. It's impossible. It's, 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 it's an impossible scenario. It's like, how can you have five when there's only one and two? One and two is three, not five. But somehow we have five. No. Justice requires equality. All people must face equal consequences. All people must be accountable equally under the law. And right now we don't have that. Not in Montana. Definitely not in Montana. Certainly not in other parts of the country, but definitely not in Montana. Welcome to the Great Montana Conspiracy. As always, thank you for your time. If you wish to support us, please do so. Like, subscribe, and by all means, share the video. If you have any questions, please refer to the information attached to the video. If it's not attached to it, please visit my... If for some reason you're watching this video and the information is not attached, go to YouTube. Look up the Great Montana Conspiracy Podcast. The information should be there. If not, visit monspiracy.podbean.com, which is where this podcast originates. As always, as I close this video... Please, in this world as it exists, please be safe, and whenever possible, please be free. Thank you.